have this thing about covering women's faces because it's either too beautiful and you don't want to get that attention or because um, families want to not show their women's faces. And that also comes from ownership of female body in uh, patriarchal societies. Men feel like they have that right to tell a female in their family to cover her face or to cover her hair or her body. And so I took that kind of to the next level and just removed my face. So it became something of like a, let's say like a modern burqar. We struggle to be strong women, we struggle to be successful women, and we try so hard, but there is a lot of people who try to bury us, because they always think that we are not good enough, and they don't want us to be in control, they don't want us to be successful. I'll go and bury myself, but when I'm in there, and when it reaches my chest, then Every time I breathe, I can feel the cracks of the glass, which was like really scary. This is how I feel in real life. فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا سورة الشرح الآية الخامسة والسادسة. I chose this verse because it means with every hardship come good things. And I feel like um, it relates to women struggling with just being women. You are the past, the present, and the future. With a heart that carries love like a goddess, you balance the mass of the world on your shoulders ever so gracefully. I am filled with admiration when I see women stand up and prove that they will not conform to remarks about their success or the way that they dress. Women are not just a bag of flesh for you to stare at with all disrespect. So for years and centuries, we've been silenced. Our bodies were became the battlegrounds of patriarchs, of racists. Now we are saying we have enough. Now we are mobilizing, organizing across the countries, including in Europe, in order to reclaim our voices and in order to reclaim our authority. A protest in Morocco's capital, Rabat. Under the law here, having sex before or outside marriage can lead to a one-year jail term. The North African country also has harsh penalties for abortion. 28-year-old journalist Hajar Raisoni stands accused of both offences. The case has driven many to protest and to demand self-determination for women. They're standing up for their rights. Young Muslim women worldwide expect more from life than their mothers and they put up with less. They want legal equality for women, with or without headscarves. And at last, the freedom to go out without a husband, brother or father as guardian. All across the Muslim world, women are fighting for social change. The story of Muhammad's first wife, Khadija, continues to inspire Muslim women today. Khadija was a special because she was a very successful businesswoman. She knew how to choose the right people to work for her. She chose Prophet Muhammad. She turned off a lot of marriages as being a respectable, rich woman. A lot of men proposed her. And she, at that time, almost 1,500 years, she knew how to say no to men. She's the one who asked Prophet Muhammad to get married. So she has the guts to so know to say, oh, this is the man, I can see the quality. I think he's good for me. I would say Khadija was empowered. Mm -hmm. She was an empowered woman. For many non-Muslims, the phrase women in Islam might immediately conjure thoughts of the oppression of women. But can Western ideas of gender equality simply be applied to the Islamic world? 
For Muslim women, the goal is to find their own path to emancipation, one that's compatible with the Quran. We're so quick to focus on the bad aspects of being a woman in the Muslim world, yeah. because yeah. the external view is, oh, Muslim women, oppressed. So let's talk about her oppression. Yeah. You know? But the same way we have women in dire circumstances that have to do with their gender here, yeah. all the way from India to Morocco, yeah. the same way there are parallel issues, different issues, yeah. in Europe, in yeah. the Western world as well. I think women all around the world are trying to figure out women's empowerment and feminism. Yeah. But I think we have an extra pressure from the outside to get it right. Oh, yeah. We already have our own battles, and I think it just makes it harder when there's a magnifying glass on us. And yeah. this magnifying glass is always not only observing us so tightly mm. that it's hard to breathe, but also then judging and then also then speaking for us and mm. telling us how to feel that you think you're not oppressed, but you are. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qiyum. La ta'khudhu sinatu wa la nom. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Man dhe alladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi iznihi ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhituna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bi ma sha'a wa si'a. كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يعوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم. My mother used to read this with me and my brother before we fell asleep. And every time that I feel lonely or scared, I can say this verse. And then I feel safer and better and more powerful. I think in these societies, feminism has less to do with trying to be equal to the man and more to do with a woman being powerful and a man being powerful in their own roles. I don't think that equality is a big topic here as much as empowerment is. We need to empower ourselves. We need to let ourselves know that we are confident. We need to tell ourselves that we are strong. We need to believe that we are beautiful. I don't think anyone can do it for us from the outside. Sara Maso is a political scientist. She works for the women's NGO Musawa in Paris. The group fights for equality and justice in Muslim families. Her own family originally came from Morocco. As a teenager in France, she encountered prejudice against her faith time and again. I was a well-spoken child. I was very loud. I was very proud to be able to memorize so many surahs from the Quran. Um, and uh, even if being the elder daughter of an imam is not easy because the community looks up to you. But when I was young, I didn't feel this pressure. I was actually looking up to my father. Uh, I liked reading the Quran out loud in the mosque. Uh, I wanted to become like him. I wanted to be able to preach, to lead the prayer. And at that time, and while growing up, I didn't really see the manifestations of patriarchy within my own religion because I was too busy fighting against Islamophobia and racism in society, uh, in school, in uh, looking for a job, in leisure activities and just in the streets. In France, where gender equality is enshrined in the constitution and religion is strictly separated from the state, many people are critical of conservative Islam. Since the Islamist terrorist attacks of 2015, the number of Islamophobic attacks in the country has increased. Many are directed against Muslim women. For author and Muslim feminist Zainab al-Mazrar, the problem isn't religion or the Quran, but patriarchy. Al-Mazrar was born in Hanover, the daughter of Moroccan immigrants. She argues for an open and critical interpretation of Islam, and she puts Muslim gender cliches under the microscope. The Islam is Traditionally, Islam is a patriarchal religion, it has to be said. That doesn't mean, and I've explored this in my book Emancipation in Islam, that the situation for women hasn't improved with Islam. The basic idea was one of caring for women, for believers. Many Muslims haven't brought this spirit of caring into the present day. 
On the contrary, they stick to these very patriarchal structures, which they haven't managed to bring out of the family and translate into freedom, into openness. The role of the woman in Islam, whether she can be emancipated within Islam, is one of the big questions of our time, because we talk a lot about Islam around the world, not just in Germany or Europe. Is emancipation possible in Islam? I'd say yes, but it's incredibly dependent on who interprets the religion and what mindset she has. Tunisia. Since the 2011 revolution, the country on the Mediterranean coast has been in a state of upheaval. The Islamic scholar Abdel Mashid Sharfi was a member of the Commission for Individual Liberties and Equal Rights. Its goal was to find solutions to achieve more rights for women. Islam cannot stand in the way of the emancipation of women, nor can Christianity or Judaism. But I say it can't in principle, because the position of women was always explicitly inferior in the monotheistic religious traditions, in all three religions. So we have to make a distinction between the religion itself and the tradition that stems from that religion. In Paris, the Simon Vio Prize is being awarded. It's named after the health minister who fought for abortion rights in France in 1975. One of the nominees is Zeynep El Rizoui. The French Moroccan worked for many years for the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. In 2015, 12 people were killed in an attack on the magazine's office. Since then, El Rizoui has been one of France's fiercest critics of Islam. Islam in a society is a factor of pressure on women. In Islam, the woman is worth less than the man and is subject to him, subordinate. Women are dependent on men, their guardianship, their money, their will, their sexual desires, which the woman is not allowed to resist, no matter if she has a wife or a lover. As soon as a woman rejects the model prescribed by society, she is denigrated as a whore. She is a woman without morals in the eyes of society. Lebanon has a long Christian tradition, but Muslims make up the majority of the population. 30 years after the civil war there, the country is divided along demographic lines. Jumana Haddad grew up in a conservative Catholic family. The experience made her an atheist. The Lebanese journalist breaks taboos with her weekly TV program. The topic today, violence against women. It happens in my society and in other Arab societies. Uh, women are reduced to uh, what's between their legs. Um, this is how um, men conceive honor. The honor of the family, their own honor, is um, uh, tied to what a woman does with her body. She is denied uh, the basic right of sexual freedom. And even if she is suspected to have done maybe something that is not uh, right by the standards of um, the um, social and religious norms, uh, she is killed. The main problem is that this uh, killer, this assassin, um, gets away with it because it is called a crime of honor. And um, it's a crime of dishonor. It's a crime. From birth to death, a woman constantly hears the words hashuma and haram. Hashuma means shame. Don't be disgraceful. That's what they used to say to us girls. Shush. And haram means sin. 
So those are the two words that accompany a woman all her life. Between shame and sin, some of us want to snatch a bit of freedom. It's not easy. The topic of sexuality in Islam is looked at very ambivalently. Our upbringing determines how we think, how we view our religion, and also that of scholars. And then, of course, ideas come from a surah in the Quran that just says you should cover your adornments, because that was the basic idea at the time, to protect women. But you start to ask, what are these adornments? Then the men start to think about it, all the scholars, and suddenly it's more than just the breasts and the genitals. Disobey, rebel, rise up and speak without apology. Let's no longer hide, the fight is in us. You like a girl away with our back up. It's never too late to say what you want to say. Try doing things more. Whether Corfil Kita be Maria Maidin. تبدت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا. This is Surah Maryam, uh, Mary, in the Quran, and I've chosen this uh, surah because. It's a surah that celebrates womanhood and creation, and we find uh, occurrences of the divine feminine in these verses through the word Ar-Rahman, the merciful, which comes from the root word Rahan, the womb. The Islamic feminist discourse operates at two levels. On one hand, it's a scholarship that critically revisit and unpack dominant religious interpretations that are discriminatory against a woman. On the second hand, it also aims to produce new knowledge that makes the case for gender equality, but within an Islamic paradigm. The objective of the feminist movement in its plurality is to challenge this patriarchal reading and to bring in woman lenses, to bring in feminist lenses in the way we understand and we approach Islam. Islamic textual sources. Sarah's role at Musawa is knowledge building coordinator. In 2009, the NGO began working in Kuala Lumpur. More than 250 activists, Islamic scholars, and lawyers from 47 countries took part in a call for equality and justice in Muslim families. And religious values were central to the appeal. Those who believe that Islamic feminism is an oxymoron or that Islam and feminism are contradictory, in fact, they need to check their own assumptions. When you believe in feminism, you can't exclude other women and other struggles from this collective struggle. Otherwise, you're not true to your feminist ethics. The Islamic feminists of Musawa especially want to empower practicing Muslim women to help them enforce their rights as mothers, wives, and citizens. According to Islamic tradition, men hold sway over women. As guardians, they decide on education, independence, work, choice of husband, divorce, and children. 
Women in the Gulf state of Oman are better off than in many other Arab countries. More women than men study in the nation's university. There is no gender segregation. But not everyone has a free choice when it comes to education. Aisha Farouk has a degree from a technical university in Muscat. She also studied in Germany for a few semesters, which is still unusual for a woman from Oman. Although there are many Omani women that are going to study abroad, but some families, maybe they still consider it easier to have their girls closer when they're still young. So I think a lot more of the male students, Omani male students, have the chance to go abroad. I also think that a lot of the girls really, really take their studies seriously as they see this as a way to gain independence and freedom. Aisha Farouk knows that feminism goes beyond the academic world. That's why she teaches in a dance studio. Girls and women's bodies are still taboo in Omani society. So developing self-confidence and self-awareness is all the more important. Three and four. Tunisian Fawzia Sharfi has been a Muslim feminist ever since she was young. She studied physics in Paris in the 1950s. For a long time, she taught at the University of Tunis, one of the few women to do so. She's concerned that women in Tunisian cities are increasingly wearing headscarves again. I like to think back to that time. My father and mother. Back then, the women were all dressed like Europeans. I love to show my grandmother because she didn't always wear headscarves. When she was at home, she was just herself. Just like the Egyptian women, Tunisian women have been struggling since the start of the 20th century. To this day, many Muslim feminists are grateful to the Tunisian reformer Tahar Haddad. In 1929, he called for the participation of women in public and political life. He believed that a free Tunisia was only possible with free women. Huda Sharawi is considered one of the most important women's rights activists in the Arabic-speaking world. She successfully fought for equal rights to be enshrined in Egypt's first constitution in 1922. She also caused an international sensation the following year when she publicly removed her veil in Cairo after a trip to Europe. In 1956, Tunisia gained its independence. The first president, Habib Bourguiba, saw himself as an advocate for women. He ushered in considerable improvements, like the prohibition of polygamy, divorce laws, and the introduction of a minimum age for marriage. Girls and women gained access to schools, universities, and the labor market. With independence in 1956, President Bourguiba took the helm. He was convinced that women should be emancipated. And women were supported by their fathers and grandfathers very early on. That's how it was with me. 
My father thought that academic success was very important. He always made sure that my educational development was taken as seriously as my brother's. remained a priority for Tunisian President Habib Bourguiba, Nasser soon became more interested in establishing an Arab League under Egyptian leadership. The Bayt al-Hikmah Academy of Sciences is located on the Gulf of Tunis. Five thick volumes of books originated here titled The Quranic Text and Its Variants. Abdel Mashid Sharfi worked for years on the contextualization of the Quran. Jewish and Christian sources were analyzed, including Aramaic and Syrian literature. The latest edition sheds new light on the familiar text. The Quran itself, as revelation, was an oral text. It was not a fixed written text. So the document we have today, this revelation, is merely the work of people. It isn't the revelation itself. The work we do helps Muslims and also non-Muslims to do away with the literal reading of the text. It's an approach that usually leads to greater interest in the spirit of the text, rather than in the literal meaning. Nearly all of the Quran's 114 surahs contain a lot of ambiguity. So we ask question, how do we know what we know? How do we know if this interpretation is actually an interpretation of what God had in mind? How do we know if this is a source of authority? Why these male scholars throughout the centuries had more authority than a woman today living in one context who understand this text for her own experience? From a woman's perspective, Tunisia is the most liberal Muslim country in the region. Even so, reforms are needed. Islamic scholar Olfa Youssef has written extensively on issues like inheritance law, polygamy and homosexuality as they relate to the Quran. Youssef compares the interpretations of male scholars from the Middle Ages to those of today and critiques their positions. Because of that, she's been threatened by Islamists. الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء صدق الله العظيم سورة 24 The Light verse 35 this verse goes very much to my heart because it addresses God as light. I see this light as the spark of consciousness that encompasses everything, people, animals, and things. It confirms that God is everything and that there is only one. Nul n'en connaît 
No one knows the interpretation but God. The problem isn't ambiguity. On the contrary, I think these ambiguous readings are an asset. They allow the text to open up. The problem comes when someone thinks, okay, this is the meaning now. This is the truth, and I'm going to impose it on others. When you read the Quran, you can't just settle for what other people say. You can listen to them, ask questions, read books. In fact, you should, and sometimes you must. But above all, you have to take responsibility for your own interpretation. First of all, I think the Quran is not what decides how people are acting. It is the translation and the interpretation of the Quran which determines how people are acting. And I think people in history have always used some kind of um, arguments to create male-dominated societies. Uh, so patriarchy is embedded in our lives, in many aspects of our lives. It's embedded in our economics, in our ethics, in our history, in our political structures. And all these forces are um, uh, uh, joining together in order to oppress women. Judaism, Christianity and Islam. All three religions refer to a common patriarch, Abraham. I believe that there are women who are trying to reconcile their faith with um, their own human dignity, um, however they can. But personally, I believe feminism is either secular or is not. Especially if we're talking about the monotheist religions, they're very patriarchal, all three of them. I mean, women is just a rib. But Islamic feminists have found arguments for the equality of man and woman in the Quran's story of creation. In Surah 4, verse 1, God didn't create the woman from the rib of the man. He created an original soul, nafsain wahidatain, which is a feminine term in Arabic. The Quran took Muslims from the injustices of their time to the justice of their time. It gave women many important rights in the patriarchal culture of 7th century Arabia. But at that time, the notion of justice didn't include the idea of equality between men and women, because gender equality is a modern concept. I chose this surah called Hafir, or Forgiving, because I love forgiveness. God created forgiveness in this bit even before he was asked for forgiveness. Ndela Paye doesn't spend much time in France anymore. She left the country because of rising Islamophobia and now lives in London. She too sees Islam as a source of empowerment for women. It's said that Muhammad gave dignity back to disenfranchised women. In pre-Islamic society in Arabia, women had the same status as animals or possessions. They didn't have the right to inherit. They were the inheritance. Girls were killed at birth. Then Islam came along and said, no, women must also have the right to inherit. That change in women's status back then was revolutionary. Women with no rights who could be killed or given away became people with the right to inherit property. Put simply, Surah 4 verse 11 states that a woman should inherit about half of what a man gets. The reason for the unequal treatment is that women didn't usually bear responsibility for providing for their families. So it was taken for granted that men should be allocated the larger share of an inheritance. The verse says that half of a share of inheritance is the guaranteed minimum for women. 
But there's nothing wrong with giving more than that. These days, women work. They participate in family life. I split expenses with my husband 50-50. I pay my taxes like a man, like any citizen. So is it ethically justifiable through religion that I only get half as much as my parents' inheritance when the Quran doesn't oppose equality in that situation? The Quran allows men to have up to four wives. Critics of Islam claim this is misogyny, an instrument of male domination. There are three verses that talk about polygamy in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, in the Surah titled Woman. And you look at the first verse, it gives you the first step solution. You can marry one to four wives, so you can't now marry 10 and 15. It is restricted. Then you have a second verse that comes and says you have to treat all of these wives equally. So you can't just, it's not just a maximum, you also have to keep in mind justice and equality. But then you have a third verse that comes. And this third verse, what this verse says, it's that actually, even if you want to be equal, God knows that you can't be. Male interpreters or patriarchs will look at these verses and say, the Quran gave me the right to marry four wives. But they don't look at the two other verses. Do you treat them equally? Even if you claim that you do, God says that you can't. The headscarf for women is one of Islam's most controversial requirements, especially in the West. But what does the Quran actually say? And can feminists wear headscarves? We're here in a French context, in an environment that is vehemently opposed to the headscarf. I am a rebel, a militant feminist. I don't want anyone to tell me whether I can wear a headscarf or not. I'm lucky enough not to be pressured by anyone in my family. My mother was against me wearing one in Senegal, but I told her that I hadn't asked for her opinion. I want to wear it one day and not the next. I don't care what people think. So in the name of gender equality, we are now denying Muslim women to control their own bodies, to appear in the public space. We are punishing them by excluding them from the schools. And now there are people who talk about uh, banning the hijab also in university. We are excluding them from workplaces. We are excluding them from leisure activities. In the minds of right-wing movements and French radical secularists, it became an obsession. The verse most often used to prescribe the so-called Islamic headscarf is a verse that simply says that the covering can be used to hide the female breast. But that has nothing to do with a requirement to cover the head. The problem is simply that within society, the headscarf is often so sacred and exaggerated that women don't get the chance to think about it themselves and say, I'll take it off. That only works in families where there is an incredible openness and love. And even in such families, there are women I've spoken to who haven't had the chance because of social pressure. Time and again, they're told that if they remove the headscarf or the veil, they're also removing their religion. خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم This is uh, Surah Al-Alaq from the Quran Actually this is the first Surah that 
Prophet Muhammad has received, and here God is ordering him to read. And this shows the importance of reading and how people should learn more every time to become better people. In her boutique in the Umani capital, Muscat, Amal al-Raisi designs what she calls modest fashion, that is, fashion that embodies Islamic values. Around the world, Muslim women spend billions on clothing and accessories every year. Al-Raisi is a mother of three, a successful fashion designer and a devout Muslim. Most of her employees are men. Islam has always respected women and always treated the woman the right way. So I think we're, I feel so lucky being a Muslim because Islam gave me all my rights. It's not about being a male or a female, it's about if you can earn it, if you can work hard to get it. You can't say that I'm a superwoman and I can do everything on my own. I don't believe that this can happen. Like for me to have things run properly, for me to be a, a successful entrepreneur, I need the support of my husband because being a mom is very important. But there are some days where I'm so busy. Like today, I have a long day of appointments and I woke up this morning, my daughter was sick. So my husband decided that he will take the day off, just making sure that someone is taking care of my daughter and that I can get my important things done. This is going to be my autumn winter collection next year. And basically it's inspired by the patterns of traditional Omani dresses. Like the abaya is something that you see everyone wearing now, but it's actually not part of our tradition. It's something that came in later on and became so trendy that everyone started wearing it. But when you go back to traditional dresses, then they're so colorful, so full of patterns and completely different than abaya. My family was, of course, practicing Islam even when they were in India. But the way that they practice Islam changed when they moved to Saudi Arabia. For example, my mom started to wear the black abaya. In India, I remember going there for summers and my aunts and my um, female cousins, everyone would wear colorful Indian clothes. But um, as the years went by and there was more and more influence of this black abaya and they also saw my mom visiting them with this black abaya and they said oh we want one too because they felt like this was the right way of the religion and now when i go back to india unfortunately everyone is wearing black Since the 1970s, Saudi Arabia and other oil-producing states have gained influence in the Islamic world. Guest workers took their experiences back to other Muslim nations. Meanwhile, rich ruling elites systematically invested in media as well as financing schools and mosques. All this led to the exportation of a highly conservative interpretation of Islam. The Iranian people overthrew the Shah in 1979, partly due to an anti-capitalist movement that wanted to end the political and economic influence of the United States. Left-wing liberals and communists, including many women, played a major role. They couldn't foresee how their situation would deteriorate under the Islamic regime with its rigid legal system controlled by Shiite religious scholars. What is Sharia really? It's not the Quran. Sharia is a Muslim law, a collection of regulations that were written, let's say, two centuries after the revelation. The indefensible thing about it is the position of women, like the stoning of women who commit adultery. There's no such thing in the text of the Quran. 
or sentencing someone to death for turning away from the religion. That doesn't exist in those terms in the text of the Quran. So today, it's very important to explain to people who want to practice Islam that there are differences between Quranic text and Sharia. All these rules and religious regulations originate from a 15th century old archaic Bedouin society. That society might have evolved more if it had stayed polytheistic and multicultural. But Islam halted everything with its sacred teachings, which it superimposed onto these Bedouin customs. Today they seem like they've been frozen in time. That's because they received the divine blessing of Islam and its sacred values. In most mosques around the world, men and women pray separately. The central area is usually reserved for men, with women at the rear of the main room, behind a screen, or in an adjoining room. Mosques have become meeting places for men. Women are best kept out of sight. But in Mecca, the holiest place for Muslims, men and women pray together. In the Hadith, which contains the sayings and habits of the Prophet Muhammad, women are allowed to lead prayers for women. So the idea of female Imams is in line with the traditions of the Prophet. Perhaps the most controversial passage in the Quran is Surah 4, verse 34. Does it really call for men to physically abuse their wives if they rebel? <laughs> I chose the verse from the surah, An Nisa, the women, because it symbolizes the superiority that Allah, the God of Islam, grants to men over women. At universities in Europe and the United States, Islamic feminists in particular have questioned this interpretation. I don't want to hear about interpretation. No, it says, beat her. Beat her. I can read Arabic, like most Arabs, right? The word means beat them. This is what Islamic scholars talk about, the ones who explain the verses page by page in the Quran. Imams and muftis say that you should beat women. Some say gently beat them, but they're still saying beat them. What is this DNA of patriarchy in Muslim legal tradition? And we found out that all these discriminatory interpretations could be traced to one verse, which is verse 434 from Surat al-Nisa. You have the word adribuhunna, which was the word that actually raised most of the controversies, and I encourage you to look at the studies and the books. There have been books written just about this small word uh, in order to unpack uh, its meaning. And again, if you look at this word, traditionally it has been interpreted and translated as, being, as meaning beating, and also used to justify uh, uh, the fact that men could beat their wives. When you look at the etymology and what uh, this word, how this word was used in other instances in the Quran, it is used for complete other uh, 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 definition and purposes. For example, it's used uh, when Moise is putting his uh, stick in order to separate um, uh, the sea in two, the word that is used is adrib. It's not, it doesn't mean beating. These interpretations, for example, will highlight the fact that this is actually a solution given by God whenever you have a conflict. Don't act aggressively, but instead just separate the bed. Peut-être vas-tu délaisser une part de ce qui t'est révélé et sens-tu ton cœur se serrer à force de les entendre dire que ne reçoit-il un trésor de là-haut ou que n'est-il accompagné d'un ange Tu n'as en vérité d'autre mission que d'avertir. Il n'est que Dieu pour veiller sur toute chose. Verset 12, surat 11. 
This verse says that the prophet was there to deliver the divine revelation, but that he was not a political leader. God alone is the guardian of all things, not the prophet. That includes religion. I think it's a great shame that in today's world, a group of Muslims, although not all of them, belong to a so-called political Islam. Unfortunately, this is spreading. There's an attempt to Islamize society, as though Islam should determine everything from justice to education to the status of women. Religion shouldn't dominate public life. That's what I'm fighting against. I think that public spaces are there for social interaction. We can't allow women to be excluded from certain spaces in this day and age. I'm a pro-secular activist, fiercely, because if we don't separate a state and religion in, in our countries, we are never going to be a modern, civilized, worthy um, states. Never. I'm not that just talking about Lebanon. I'm talking about everywhere. You cannot mix religion with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, politics. Personnellement, j'ai toujours refusé. Personally, I've always resisted the idea that the fate of Muslim women depends on a possible reform of Islam. We approach all other social issues, whether in the economy, sport, culture, environment, or whatever, with the secular knowledge we have today. But as soon as we talk about women, we are talking about God. God says this. Allah says that. It is about religion. But why should women be defined as Muslims for all eternity and not as citizens, as human beings? The emancipation of women can't wait until Islam is reformed politically somewhere down the line. My hope is that many people aren't afraid of emancipation. Emancipation doesn't take anything from people, it's the opposite. It gives so much, like joy, like new discoveries. The only thing we have to do, of course, is now and then tread a path we've never taken before. Tunisia's revolution had a lot to do with emancipation. After the overthrow of the dictator, Tunisians adopted a constitution that put women and men on equal footing. Women are now allowed to marry non-Muslims, and violence against women is an offence. The virus, and I mean that positively, is here. Today, Tunisians talk about homosexuality and Islam. They talk about equality in inheritance law and in Islam. They discuss the relationship between being Muslim and being a citizen in a democratic country and try to overcome the division and the problems. But still, some say it's impossible to be a Muslim, especially a Muslim woman, and modern, or that it's impossible to be Muslim and to stand for absolute equality between men and women. In the struggle for an Islamic feminism, Muslim women are rising up and fighting their way towards emancipation with bravery and wisdom. If you look even at the, one of the most uh, advanced European, uh, European um, countries, very few have 50-50% uh, representation between men and women. And it's appalling. I mean, like, for example, when I look at sometimes um, the leaders, um, are the prime ministers of Europe, when they're gathered all together and I see just Angela Merkel and maybe one other woman and then all men, I say, this is Europe. What's happening? 
This is 2019 in Europe. What then are we supposed to do here if that is Europe? You know what I mean? So you have a lot to do as well. Don't think that it is over. I'm